Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. This sighting was told to me by a man that I have known for over 20 years. We have hunted and fished many times together over the years, and I have never known him to tell tall tales. He is very respected in the community where he lived. He said that he had been cutting a load of firewood and was coming down a dirt road that goes from the bottom of the canyon on the Snake River and goes up into the timber. He said it was hunting season and from one place on this road he could look down the mountain and he thought he could see a bear by a salt box. These salt boxes are put up by ranchers to put blocks of salt out for cattle. He said his intention was to shoot this bear, so he hurried down the road in his pickup. There are many switchbacks coming down this road, and so at times he couldn't see a thing. When he finally could see it again, he was about 400 yards from it. He said that it stood up on its hind legs and quickly walked about 40 to 50 yards where it went down into a steep creek bottom. He said that if it was a person, that the person would have been dressed in dark brown or black clothing from head to toe all one color. He said it was over six feet tall. He also said that there were no other vehicles in this area and no other roads into this area. He said that he didn't stop and go look for footprints and that he just kept on driving past the spot but with a very funny feeling about what he had just seen. He was alone at the time. The sighting occurred in Hell's Canyon. The terrain is very steep and has many lava rims throughout this whole area. There are many creeks in this area. The whole area is cut by many creeks and each creek has a cut steep gully which many describe as canyons. Extremely rough terrain. The upper reaches of this area has pine and fir forest. As you get lower down the canyon, the vegetation is mainly brush and alders. In the creek bottoms and grass-covered hillsides all the way down to the Snake River, which has formed this whole area. On to the next one. Outside the town of Colton in Clackamas County in Oregon, I was bow hunting and had parked myself between two deer trails, each running alongside a clear cut. I was dead center, with 25 yards between me and each trail. I faced west into the wind at about dusk. There was usually a lot of deer in the area, but on that evening, it seemed very quiet. Just as it became too dark to see my aiming sight, I heard crunching footsteps coming from directly behind me. At the time, I thought it might be a buck in rut. The animal seemed to be following my scent directly to where I was hidden in some blackberry bushes. A cover scent had been applied to my clothes and boots using pine needles that were blended with water. My clothes were soaked in the solution and dried very effectively, for deer anyway. This animal walked right up to the clearing behind me. I had plenty of time to turn around to situate myself for a clear shot. I raised my bow and it came into view 25 yards away and stopped. It seemed to know exactly where I was sitting. We were staring at each other from a distance of about 75 feet for about a full minute. The Bigfoot slowly swayed back and forth a few inches from side to side. I estimated it to be about seven and a half feet tall and maybe 600 plus pounds. I never pulled back the bow and the Bigfoot eventually just turned around and walked in the same direction it came from. Because of the thick leaves on the ground, no tracks were found the next day when I returned to look around. This animal was black in color, and its shoulders were approximately four feet wide. Since this incident happened, I've brought up the subject with many people in this area, and I'm surprised at how many have or know someone who has experiences in this country. On to the next one. In Clackamas County, near Estacada in Oregon, 
Lorraine Davis called Ray Crow to say they had gone to Estacada to get tree cutting permit. As they drove through the canyon on Springwater Road near Gerber's feed store, Dan noticed what he thought was a great big gorilla type thing. Probably his imagination, he said. It was 2 p.m. and they were about five miles out of Oregon City. He said it was a big dark creature. Dan said extremely big, just standing, and by then they had gone past, but he didn't stop. It was raining, and the creature was 100 to 150 feet off the road. On to the next one. I was in Oregon up in the mountains at the Cornucopia Ghost Town. My older brother and I were messing around in the creek below the ghost town, and we looked up to see Bigfoot running up the creek. We were a little scared at seeing what looked to be a very hairy human running up past us. It just not really looked like a human face. It was different. He kind of looked like a monkey with a human body. My brother and I ran up to where our family was having a barbecue, and they ran down just in time to see him running into the trees. Since that day, I've been very interested in this mysterious creature that has left an image in my head. My older brother and my two younger brothers, my mother and aunt, were all witnesses. My older brother was the one messing around in the water with me, and the rest of the family was up at the camp they had set up for our barbecue. The lighting was bright enough to tell the description of the creature. It was midday with a little cloud cover. He was in the open when he ran through the creek and then ran into the wood, which was the pine forest, and he was headed up higher into the mountains. On to the next one. Out the back of Moore Mill, near Brandon in Oregon, Dusty Anderson and his friend, Dusty Everdeen, were riding their motorcycles when they decided to stop for a rest. When they looked across the valley, they saw an animal about six to seven feet tall with very wide shoulders and walking on two legs. They watched it get up, walk around on two feet, and then sit on a stump. On to the next one. This happened in Marion County in Oregon. It was 5.30 p.m. near Beaver Creek and Carter Road. From a distance of 200 yards, atop a neighboring grassy field, my brothers and I saw a red-haired creature running from the field down into the forest area, which leads into the forest and a Christmas tree field. The creature seemed to be startled because at the time we were harvesting the neighboring field 200 yards away. The terrain was a grass seed field and on the top of the hill that was forest and brush. The creature had thin red hair that was approximately four inches long all over its body. It had very muscular long arms which resembled an ape. This creature seemed to use its arms to brace itself down the steep hillside on to the next one. I had just graduated high school the year before and would occasionally head over to the school parking lot to hang out with some old friends and chew the fat. My friend Ernie had a 1967 Impala Super Sport 396 cubic inch four speed. It was blue with a black interior and he kept this thing up like it was the last car on earth. I was in the school lot on this particular day, casually walking around his car, when I noticed a couple of small dents in the driver's door and front fender. The finish on Ernie's car was like glass, and I have never seen any chip, let alone dents in it, so I asked him what had happened. He told me, that he and his girl, Marianne, were up at the Overlook the other night and some homeless people were throwing rocks at some of the cars. I told him that I had never so much as heard of a homeless person in the entire county in all the days I lived there, which was my entire life. He said, yeah, they're there all right, and with the exception of those who don't know any better, Nobody is parking there anymore. I thought this was the nuttiest thing that I had ever heard and decided to take matters into my own hands, so to speak. At that time, 
I was driving a 73 Nova that was in no way, shape, or form in the condition of Ernie's car. That being said, I decided to do a little experiment. This parking area was somewhat of an overlook at the end of a dirt path where kids would stop and listen to the radio at night. I had been there many times in the past, and I had certainly never had any rock thrown at me, but it had been quite some time since I had last been there. Well, as it were, I had devised a plan to catch these rock-chucking creeps red-handed. I gathered together a few boys, and each week for a month, we were going to park on Friday night at the Overlook. Every Friday, I had four guys with me with flashlights and baseball bats. So if someone threw a rock at my car, they were going to get their ass whooped good. On the first two Fridays, nothing had happened whatsoever, having parked there for almost three hours each night. In fact, one night, a cop came by and asked us what we were doing. When I told him, he just rolled his eyes and took off. The third Friday was a rain out. After about an hour, we just gave up. Figuring that no people, homeless or otherwise, would be out in the pouring rain, and so we split. It was on the fourth Friday of our stakeout when this whole Bigfoot thing unraveled before our very eyes. We were there in my Nova with the radio on very low, and there was a station wagon about 30 feet away from us with a group of kids in it. This happened to be a moonless night, and it was exceedingly dark in this overlook location. We had been sitting there for the better part of an hour when we heard a large metallic rap, 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 of which sounded like stone bouncing off the station wagon's hood in conjunction with a girl in the car screaming. My recollection is that it wasn't ten seconds later when someone said in a loud voice, there's something standing in there with glowing red eyes. On that note, the five of us jumped out of the car with our flashlight blazing and ran headlong into the woods. I was the first to step in with my light pointed directly in front of me when, standing maybe 20 feet away, was the silhouette of a massive creature with glowing red eyes. They were as bright as a car headlight shining on a bicycle reflector at night. I yelled out, holy shit. The other guys immediately had put their lights on the same thing. This monster just stood there, and I didn't as much as flinch. We stood our ground as well. I remember the five of us looking back and forth at each other and at it as if to say, what now? This thing, which I now know was a Bigfoot, flexed its arm in what I will call a bodybuilder pose, turned around and walked into the woods. We had our lights on it the entire time. I remember it staring directly into the light as though they didn't bother it at all. It had to be every bit of eight feet tall or more, and was as wide as the back of my Nova's trunk lid. As we started to talk, some of the kids got out of the station wagon and asked us what we had seen. Eddie said, It was a damn monster. Kyle exclaimed, It was a creature from hell. What we could agree on was that we had seen a large, hairy beast with glowing red eyes that had apparently thrown rocks at the car next to us. Both of these were now facts that we knew were true no matter what anyone else thinks or says. A short while later, we left the scene and actually ran into the officer we had previously seen up there parked in his car in town. When we told him what had just happened, he said, why don't we go back and have a look around? That is, if you're not afraid. The fact was that we were afraid, but we weren't going to tell a cop that. So he followed us back to the overlook. When we pulled in, he panned the area with his floodlight before we all got out of the car. And when he asked where we had seen the creature, we brought him to the exact spot. As we looked around, he said, well, look at this. 
Maybe you kids aren't half crazy after all. He had his own flashlight pointed directly at the ground on what was a large footprint in the peat of the wood. He took his club off his belt and laid it next to it, saying that the print was about 20 inches long and 8 wide. It wasn't that we needed any proof of what we saw, but now the cop was on board after seeing the footprint himself. He said to us that he didn't know what we had seen, but it was definitely not a bear track. He added, whatever has a foot that big has to have a body to match. We looked around a little bit more and nothing else came of it. Two years later, our family had moved away from the area to New Jersey, but the memory remains until this day. I often feel the urge to drive back to Ohio and see if the spot is still there, but I guess I never will. On to the next one. I used to be an avid bow hunter. Going out into places, people seldom, if ever, ventured. Nobody ever tells a bow hunter to never hunt alone, to take somebody along like they do when you're a hiker. It's a solitary sport, and that's why I enjoyed it. I think it was also the man versus nature thing, seeing if you could survive your own wayfinding and weather reading. This was back before everyone carried a GPS. Of course, all this was when I was younger, and now my only sport is fly fishing, and I never go alone. Let me tell you why I switched sport and philosophies. I was in my early 30s and in extraordinary shape. I worked construction, and that kept me hopping. I was also a distance runner, so I had a good set of lungs and legs. I got into distance running when I was in high school, and I just kept at it. It helped me clear my mind, especially when I had problems. I would go out and just run and run. Good thing as I believed that these things are what kept me alive that day in late September, a good 20 years back. I was in the kind of shape one needs to be to make an escape, which fortunately I did, obviously, or I wouldn't be here telling the story. I was hunting in the thick timber in the Bridger Mountains of Montana, above Bozeman. Even though the area is close to a pretty good-sized town, as you get further away, it becomes the kind of wild country where seeing another human kind of makes you startled. I was up above what's called Fairy Lake. If you know where that is, I read not too long ago of another sighting there at that lake, and people should be aware of what's up there and just stay away if they know what's best. I was all dressed in green camis and was just quietly walking through the forest up there looking for signs of deer as it was the start of deer bow hunting season. I had just enough blaze orange on me to tell someone not to shoot, just a patch of orange flagging tied onto my cap. I would stop every so often and just hang out, hoping a deer would come by. Well, it was a bit before dawn, and I had hiked up the side of this one big drainage for about an hour, using a headlamp to see my way until it got light. I wanted to be ready up in the high timber when the sun came up. It's hard to hike like that in the dark, and you'd better have a good sense of direction, or you'll end up where you don't want to be but the early pre-dawn light told me which way was east and I was doing okay, coming up right where I wanted to. Once I could see enough to tell, I stopped and watched as the early light started, opening things up a bit. I had slipped behind a tree, as was my habit when hunting, and all of a sudden, I could hear something coming up exactly where it hiked along an animal trail. I got my bow ready, thinking, man, if I get a deer this early, I'll be set, though disappointed a bit. It would be too easy. Killing the deer wasn't really a sport for me, as I hunted from necessity, and my family would eat on it all winter. The sport was in the tracking and not in getting myself lost. Okay, so there I was, hiding behind a pretty good-sized pine at the break of dawn, 
barely light enough to see where I was at when something was coming up the trail where I had just hiked. The more I thought about it, this kind of bothered me because animals have very keen senses of smell and will seldom go where you just went. They go the opposite way. And that meant it was probably a grizzly bear, the one creature out there not afraid of humans. And that was the last thing I wanted to meet up with. The thought that one is adequately armed with a bow against a grizzly isn't much of a thought. I reached for my bear spray, the one thing I always carried any time I was in grizzly country. I pulled it out of my belt holster and got ready. No point in even messing around with my bow. That would just make it mad. I held my breath as this thing got closer and closer and bigger and bigger sounding. Holy crap, from the sound of it, this was one big bear. It was breaking through the timber as it came along and making all kinds of noises, all kinds of sound, like it was mad. Oh man, this was scaring me bad. And I even toyed with running, which you never do around bears. I waited it out as that was all I could do. But just as it got to what sounded like about 50 feet away, it turned around and took off running, making an even louder crashing sound. I could hear it thumping along and it really sounded huge. And that's when it dawned on me that this thing was running on two legs, not four. I breathed a sigh of relief. The bear must have caught my scent, realized how close I was, and headed out. I right then and there was ready to call it a day and get back to my truck because one thing I won't mess around with is grizzlies. Well, there are two things now, as you'll see. As I stood there, waiting for my legs to stop shaking so I could walk on back, here came a big buck running madly through the trees in the direction from where the bear had just gone. I mean, it was scared out of its senses as it came right next to me. I hated to shoot it. It didn't seem like a fair fight, but I thought of how much venison we'd have through the winter, so I drew back and let go. I'm a good shot, but nobody could have missed at that close range. I shot it right through the heart, and it dropped instantly. I always prided myself on quick kills as I hated to see an animal suffer. So there lay this big four-point buck literally at my feet. I would have to dress it there and carry it out in several trips as it was big and no way could I drag it out, so I set to it, wondering if that grizzly would come back. I worked quickly and soon was on my way, carrying part of the animal over my shoulder. I wanted to get out fast, and I was even toying with the idea of not going back for the rest. It had dawned on me that a buck like that wouldn't normally be afraid of a grizzly bear. I got down to my pickup and put the meat into the back pulling a big canvas tarp over it. I sat there for a bit, wondering if I should go back for the rest. The pickup was parked at the very end of the road, a short daging place for hikers and horseback riders at the trailhead. I was the only one there, and I didn't expect to see anyone else, given the time of the year and that it was hunting season. I got out my little camp stove, made myself a cup of coffee, then sat there some more. The sun was now moving up, and lighting up the higher timber, so I figured it was about 7 a.m. I had all day to get the rest of the buck out. I sat there for the longest time. I sure didn't want to meet up with the grizzly. I decided to leave several times, then would think of all that meat, and it would change my mind. I finally decided the best way to do something was to do it, and I got up and hiked back up there. Man, I was on edge. That bear had sounded like several bears all wrapped up into one, and I sure didn't want to meet it. As I got close to my deer, I kind of stealthily snuck up, thinking it could be there eating on it. I watched real carefully for some time before going on in and putting the second load over my shoulder and heading back down. The only thing around was a bunch of ravens, and they were making a ruckus. I knew they wanted to eat some of that deer. I stopped several times on the way back to make sure I wasn't being followed. I had heard plenty of stories growing up about bears taking a hunter's kill, though not directly from them, but there was a first for everything, which I soon learned. I got back to the truck and removed the tarp and put the second load in the back. 
I could get the remainder in one more load. I once again toyed with the idea of just heading out. Pretty happy I had managed to get a nice big buck that fast, especially after hearing that bear. I got into the truck and sat there for a minute, kind of getting my breath and enjoying the wood, knowing I wouldn't be back until next year. Once again, I was indecisive. We needed that meat, but I sure was getting tired. It took an hour every time I hiked back up there. I didn't want to go again. I was tired and admittedly still spooked. That's when I noticed the ravens again. They seemed to have followed me out. There was a good dozen or so sitting there in the trees above, looking down at me and silently watching. I decided to go get the rest of the buck. It would be enough to get us through the winter. I had three kids and a wife to think of, and I didn't make all too much doing construction. I had already got our wood for the winter, and this would make sure we got through okay. I made sure the tarp was covering the meat so the birds couldn't get to it, then I headed back up the hill. Once again, I was extremely cautious, but once again, there was nothing around. I retrieved the rest of the buck with no problem other than being pretty tired at this point, and I noticed that there were no ravens around, which surprised me. I figured they would be trying to munch on what I'd left there. I decided they all must be down by my truck. I hurried down, happy to be getting off the mountain with my last load. It would be a successful hunt. I could go home and have a nice hot dinner with my family. I was nearly back when I thought I heard something. I stopped, trying to figure it out. It was in the distance, in the direction of my truck, and it sounded like a hundred ravens all cawing at once. It was kind of unsettling, to be honest. I had never heard such a ruckus, and it made me wonder I'd been in the woods since I was a kid. It got louder the closer I got to the trailhead, and I finally had to put the deer down and stop. What the hell? What in the world was going on? The only way I can describe it is that it sounded like a football game with ravens cheering instead of people, but once in a while, I could hear a howling that for sure wasn't any raven. I knew enough not to just blunder back to my truck. I don't think anyone would have been that stupid with something like that going on. Although, I know some people who think humans are at the top of the food chain and don't worry about anything. So I left the deer and kind of sulked through the trees, dodging and hiding until I came close enough to see what was going on. As I finally got to where I could see my truck, I thought I was imagining things. There was a big bunch of ravens flying and swooping around my truck, probably 30 or more, all squawking and making loud raven noises, diving in when they dared for a bite of the feast. The deer portions were no longer in the bed of my truck, but had been dragged a few feet away and were on the ground, scattered around into various pieces. What had done the dragging and tearing? I knew that the ravens and wolves had a symbolic relationship in the wild, as the raven will tell wolves where the prey is by making a lot of noise, but they needed the wolves to kill it, and ravens can't get into a carcass without something big tearing it up first. What had these ravens attracted to my deer, with all their noise? Now, I could see something huge over behind the truck, all bent over. At first, I thought it was the grizzly I'd almost met earlier, and a chill came over me. How could I get into my truck and out of there? What if it stayed there a long time, guarding its feast? How could I get back? But now, the creature stood up. Holy crap, this was no bear. I felt my knees literally get weak, and I thought I might pass out. I could only see it from the chest up as it was behind the truck, but what I saw was the legendary creature called Bigfoot, and I can tell you the rest of it was big enough to go with the feet. It had a chest as thick as any grizzly or even a Kodiak bear, and it stood taller. It had dark, reddish hair, all smooth in spots and rough in others, and the hair on its head was longer. Its head seemed to have a sort of crest on top, where the forehead met the upper skull, and it had huge, piercing eyes, eyes that seemed to see me. I suddenly felt Sheer terror like I've never felt before or since, even earlier when I thought a huge grizzly was coming right up the trail toward me. 
It was almost a supernatural terror, like I was looking at a creature from another reality. I thought I knew it shared my world as it was eating my deer, but it felt like it was looking at a combination of legend, reality, and imagination. But I knew it had sensed my presence somehow. It knew I was there watching, even though I was well hid. It stood straight up and walked around the back of the truck, and then I could see this thing had a big chunk of meat in its human-like hand, and it had black fingernails. It paused a moment, carefully placed the meat on the truck bumper, then started coming towards me. The ravens went into a frenzy, diving for the meat. I was frozen for a moment, just watching it coming, noting how huge its stride was, how muscular it was, how long its arms hung, as if watching a movie, very detached. But then, something kicked in, a flight instinct, and I turned and started running. I ran for my life, and I knew I didn't stand a chance, as the creature could move so much faster than me with its long, muscular legs. I ran right into the rest of the deer I'd been carrying, jumped it, and continued on. I then kind of turned toward the road, as I knew instinctively to somehow parallel it if I wanted to get back and knock it lost. It was a good six or seven miles down to the main road. I could hear this thing coming after me, and it started screeching like a banshee, only ten times as loud. It sounded really mad. It was breaking tree branches as it came, and then all of a sudden, it stopped. I knew it had found the rest of the deer, and it apparently found that more interesting than chasing me. It had succeeded in getting me out of its territory, and I hoped it would consider that good enough but I kept running. I could feel my heart beating hard, and I knew it was from pure, deep, animal fear. I thought of that poor buck I'd shot. I soon cut out of the trees and onto the road where I could still make better time, and I ran and ran, my mind focused only on getting back to my wife and kid. I eventually came to the main road, but there was no traffic, so I kept running. It was a good 20 miles back to town, but I was tired when I started, and I was rapidly losing strength. After a few more miles, I had to walk, and I kept thinking I could hear it coming behind me, but it wasn't there when I looked. I was afraid to turn away, and I started walking backwards, nearly tripping numerous times. I was depleted. I had nothing, virtually no energy. Finally, I tumbled to the ground. I hit the wall. I just lay there, and then came the sobbing. I was traumatized and couldn't help it, but it seemed to be cathartic to cry. But now I noticed it was starting to get on towards evening. I had to get out. It was too cold to spend the night out, and I wasn't sure if the beast wasn't still coming after me. It could eat its dinner, take a nice long nap, and still catch up to me. I managed to stand up and start slowly walking out, but it was a supreme effort. I felt like I had just climbed a huge mountain, and I realized I hadn't eaten since breakfast, nor had anything to drink, and I had just climbed that mountain three times and run a good ten miles or so. Just as I felt like I couldn't take one more step, a car came down the road. I managed to flag it down, though I thought for a while it wasn't going to stop. It was a woman from town, and she acted half afraid of me, but I finally convinced her to call the sheriff to come and get me. I remember feeling the deepest sense of desolation as I saw her taillight going down that road into the deepening evening, but it wasn't long before a pickup came by and stopped. It was a local, and he gave me a ride. I told the guy my truck had broke down, and by the time we saw the sheriff coming down the road, I had decided I didn't want to tell the story to anyone, as I knew they would think I was nuts. So he flagged him down, and I lied and said my truck wouldn't start. The sheriff offered to take me out there, but I said I'd get it tomorrow, and the local guy gave me a ride home. I didn't go out there for several days, but finally my brother and I went. My truck sat there just as I'd left it. it. There was nothing there to corroborate any of my story. No deer hide, nothing. I was beginning to think nobody would believe me. Even my own brother seemed kind of skeptical, like he thought it had been a grizzly. But when I got home, I was taking the tarp from the back of the truck, and that's when I realized my bow and arrow were gone. Normally, they would be the first thing I looked for, but I was still pretty out of it. I told my brother, and he just shook his head and looked at me kind of funny. He said, 
Someone had obviously been out there and stolen my bow, but I knew better. Maybe the Bigfoot had watched me shoot the deer and was going to become a bow hunter. Maybe he's out there right now practicing using that tree I was hiding behind. I don't know, but after that day, I'll believe about anything, and I also believe I'm never going back out there. In fact, I know that as a true fact. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!